So welcome to the second podcast or the second installment of the Miami History Podcast. Uh, my name is Casey Paquette, uh, co-founder of the Miami History Channel and blogger. I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Paul George, also co-founder of the Miami History Channel and very well-noted historian in, in Miami. So, Paul, you want to say hello? Uh, it's just great being here, Casey. Hello to all of our listeners, too. We're uh, broadcasting from uh, beautiful Brickell Avenue in a very historical home, the Nolan House, built in the mid-20s during the flush of Miami's first great real estate boom. And this is a great neoclassical-style building. I'm looking out of the columns right now. And looking across the street at uh, some of the handiwork of Architectonic, among others, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So it's a very historical area, you know, thinking that this was jungle land 100 plus years ago. And to see it today is amazing. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And uh, boy, we, we feel blessed in, in Miami. Um, you know, I'm, I'm watching the news this morning and Chicago is going to get a foot of snow. It's just cold and miserable in so many places. And I walked just five blocks uh, to get here today, and, uh, you know, I worked up a nice sweat. It's just a beautiful uh, February uh, morning in, uh, in Miami. Uh, we are recording this in uh, mid-February, and uh, we will hopefully publish this very soon. So, um, so getting back to the podcast, the, uh, the podcast is uh, sponsored in, uh, by the Miami History Channel. The Miami History Channel is a project between Paul and myself to have him narrate and, and us produce many documentaries on Miami's history. Uh, it's, a very, it's a membership site. It's a very nominal uh, price. You can see previews of each of the episodes. It's only twenty nine ninety five for the entire year to be a part of the Miami History Channel and to get access at your convenience for any of these documentaries. So if you like this content, if you love Miami history, we would encourage you to check it out. It's uh, www.miamihc.com. Of course, HC is for History Channel. Well, getting back to the podcast, um, the uh, format of this podcast is me interviewing Paul with a series of questions on a topic. Our very first podcast um, had started with the father of Miami, uh, Henry Flagler, and just a little background on who he was and what brought him to Florida and ultimately to Miami. So where we left off was uh, Flagler had extended his railway, had built up cities all the way to Palm Beach, uh, and then the eight, uh, freezes of 1894 and 95 hit and really had a big impact on the state of Florida, so much so that it was the final catalyst for Henry Flagler to extend his railway to Miami. Paul, could you talk a little bit about what those two freezes really meant for central and northern Florida? Well, they hit the area really, really hard. Uh, and it just, I think, shocked a lot of people. But more importantly, it put a lot of people out of business. For example, William Burdine, who had gone to found the, the great department store chain, uh, he was an orange grower in a little place called Homeland in Polk County, uh, whose county seat is Bartow, Florida. And he was doing fine, had come to Florida from Mississippi for reasons of respiratory problems. And that freeze put him out of business and prompted him to go into retail um, soon after and eventually to move to Miami. Uh, but it's interesting because the Spanish, in many ways, established the citrus industry in Florida going back to the 16th and 17th centuries in St. Augustine. But uh, as time went on, of course, it was obvious that the climate was milder as you move farther south. And what this freeze did was it, um, it underlined the fact that you had to keep moving south because... Uh, much of the citrus industry by the mid-1890s was in central Florida, bordering on northern Florida. And this freeze, of course, damaged and destroyed so many crops that more and more growers are thinking about heading south. Well, ultimately, a lot of those people headed to Miami, which was a non-starter at that time. Um, but it would become a starter once Flagler moved his railroad in 1896 to the future Magic City. And so that freeze not only prompted growers to think about moving farther south, whether it be milder weather in the winter, but also it prompted many of them to start over again in this brand new community in 1896 by the name of Miami. And what's interesting on a personal note is that those freezes also led my family to Miami in the late 1890s as well. Uh, they were citrus growers up in Apopka. Um, the freezes pretty much ended that industry. A lot of people got out of it, and my great uncle, uh, had spent time looking for what he was going to do next. Uh, ultimately, in 1899, he came down uh, to Miami, settled as a, a pioneer, 
and uh, ultimately ran the first residential-style funeral home known as Combs Funeral Home. So for any old Miamians um, that uh, remember Combs, uh, that name pretty much went away in the early 1970s through acquisition, but um, uh, the Combs were a very big part of uh, Miami in the first half to three quarters of the last century. Uh, so that on a personal note, but uh, so now the freezes that occurred, we talked a bit about in the first podcast of uh, Henry Flagler dispatching James Ingram. And I know part of that was to uh, have Flagler help out some of the growers uh, and, and see what he can do. But also part of it was to understand where the freezes didn't hit. So Ingram goes down, ultimately reacquaints himself with an old friend, Julia Tuttle, and figures that the freezes did not reach Miami. Henry Flagler, uh, or Ingram, brings back uh, the unscathed orange blossoms and some other um, vegetation to prove to Flagler that the freezes did not reach Miami. And at that point, he's sold. He's ready to make the move down to Miami and extend the railway. So, um, Paul, could you talk a little bit about that, that interaction between Flagler, Julia Tuttle, and then ultimately we'll talk later about uh, his negotiations also with the Brickles. But talk a little bit about that first visit when he came down to inspect for himself the area that is now known as Miami. Well, sometime in late February of 1895, after Engram had brought back proof but also testimony that the freeze has, had reached Miami, Flagler told Engram to arrange for him to come to Miami uh, oftentimes called Fort Dallas at that time for an army fort that had stood there during the Second and Third Seminole Wars. Uh, so Flagler told Ingram, arranged for me to come down to Miami to meet Mrs. Tuttle, who had written me earlier offering some choice land on Biscayne Bay and the Miami River in exchange for me extending my railroad where it had stopped in West Palm Beach in 1894 to the Miami River. And so he came down to visit Julia Tuttle in late February of 1895, and they talked, and uh, it was about lunchtime, and they went over to the Peacock Inn by boat because there was nothing in Miami. The Florida State Census in 1895 only found nine people living along both banks of the Miami River near or at the mouth of the river. That's how small this settlement was. And they went over to the Peacock Inn, and um, Isabella Peacock and her husband Charles maintained that along with their sons. And Coconut Grove, relatively speaking, was flourishing in comparison with Miami at the time. It was a very kind of an artsy place and just, you know, a beautiful vista looking out over the bay from that ridge. And uh, they came back to Tuttle's place, and uh, there Flagler verbally agreed to move his railroad to the Miami River. And according to one of the stories found in an early history of Miami by Helen Muir, uh, Tuttle just couldn't believe that after uh, several years of badgering or attempting to badger Flagler to bring his railroad to Miami that her good fortune had finally occurred. And she turned to Flagler, according to this source, and said, well, how much of that railroad do you own? And he said, you see this cigar? I mean, he was a cigar smoker, like many men were at the time. And she said, yes. He said, I own as much of that railroad as I own of this cigar, which was a reassurance to her that he had the wherewithal to bring the rail to Miami. And um, Flagler, soon after, and this was a verbal agreement at that point, uh, began to build his railroad from West Palm Beach down into Miami, hiring hundreds of laborers to clear a right of way, to build a rail bed, uh, to lay track, and ultimately in mid April of 1896, April 13th, 1896, the Florida East Coast Railway, as it was now named, entered Miami uh, for the first time. By then, there were already hundreds of people working and living here, mainly males. So uh, what I always found very interesting is that, you know, people believe that Flagler brought everybody to early Miami who built things up. But I think once word got out that Henry Flagler had agreed to extend his railway, uh, it permeated not only through the state of Florida, but through Georgia and through other surrounding areas. And speculators, opportunists, people that really had that pioneer uh, spirit decided they wanted to come down and be a part of it. And that really defined early Miami and those early pioneers. Um, so once Flagler had extended the railway, he had built the Royal Palm Hotel as he had promised. He had laid out streets and, and some infrastructure. And Maybe the Brickles would argue he did the bare minimum for them on the south side. But once all that was complete, um, can you talk a little bit about the early years and the fact that Miami was really considered a railroad town and, and sort of the conflict that that caused for some people that were not part of the railway? Well, uh, the Flagler influence in Miami was really strong, beginning with the fact that a 
sizable percentage of people living in Miami in 1896, 1897, and even thereafter were employed by some element or some aspect of the Flagler Enterprises, whether it's working at the hotel that he built, this grand hotel, the Royal Palm, uh, or helping to build the hotel, or working at the railroad station. Uh, there were so many facets of Flagler's economic uh, influence over Miami at that time that uh, many people you know, saw it as a kind of a railroad town, but also politically. I mean, it was his people that said, in, at least in June of 1896, we need to incorporate as a city. It was his people that uh, were strong influences over the first newspaper in Miami, the Miami Metropolis, which, which began publishing in May of 1896. Um, his people really directed the incorporation, uh, laid out uh, the tentative boundaries of the original city of Miami. So all of this was was part of, I think, the strong grip that Flagler had over Miami. He was a frequent visitor here. Probably his most trusted lieutenant here was a man named Joseph A. McDonald, who then would go off on his own but stayed close to Flagler and become a premier banker and entrepreneur and hotel owner and operator and, and just a beloved person in Miami. And it was McDonald's son-in-law, John Riley, who worked for the railroad as a bookkeeper at one point and worked for uh, Flagler, uh, who would become the first mayor of Miami. So I think, indeed, it was a, a company town. Even with Flagler not owning outright a lot of things, like the metropolis, he still exerted a strong influence over these elements of, of early Miami. Very interesting, and, and it certainly was a railroad town, probably through, um, what would you say, the uh, until maybe the land boom of the 1920s? Yeah, well, I think uh, Flagler died in 1913, in May of 1913. I think at that point, that was a, a decade of tremendous growth for Miami, and I, I think it was much less so railroad town at that point. Miami at that point was 17 years of age at the time of Flagler's death, and now the great employer, at least temporarily, was James Daring, building Vizcaya. Uh, so I think things were beginning to shift at that point, but the railroad still had a huge role in Miami. It, most of the people who visited Miami from far away came by rail at that time. There just weren't enough roads. Uh, so the railroad was a strong influence and, and continue to be. So uh, Henry Flagler, uh, I guess you never can say a city is built and complete, but once he uh, met his obligations, um, he wasn't done. He was an older gentleman. Uh, he wanted to, uh, he had one more project that he wanted to accomplish. Uh, he even said, uh, I think I've heard you say this on several occasions, he, his vision or his lifelong dream was to extend the railway to Key West. Right, he did yeah. say that. And, and, and could you talk a little bit about kind of that project, that point in time in his life, and what it meant to actually reach Key West through the Overseas Railway? Well, he was a multimillionaire, and he was aging. Uh, he lived to be 83 years of age, and so when they broke ground for the Overseas Railroad in 1905, he was um, eight years shy of his death, so he was in the mid-70s, which was considered quite old at that time, but he was still pretty energetic. And uh, it was a challenge. He'd been thinking about this long before he moved his railroad to Miami. I've seen letters from, or copies of letters from the Flagler organization when they referenced in 1893, Mr. Flagler is determined to, uh, to build a railroad to the sea. Um, I, you know, he had his millions. Um, he really didn't have much more to achieve in the economic sphere, but this was a great uh, building, engineering, technological challenge, and he wanted to embrace it. And um, so he did something that was unprecedented. You know, he built these viaducts and bridges that extended for miles, like the Seven Mile Bridge, in order to bring that railroad over the sea all the way down to Key West, which is a long distance from the tip of the peninsula, and was able to do that. And as you've indicated, uh, it was said that he said in 1912, when the railroad entered uh, Key West in January of 1912, my lifetime dream has been achieved, now I can die peacefully. Yeah, and I, I found it very interesting, uh, of course. A number of books have been written on that project. Um, the uh, Last Train to Paradise is, is one example. Uh, Seth Bransom has written a number of books on the FEC Railway. Uh, but... Uh, one thing that I found very interesting was really how they were able to build um, the columns uh, in the ocean and salt water with a cement formula that uh, a lot of people said was uh, never replicated. It was a German formulation, and um, after that was built, um, that formula stayed with the engineers <laughs> and never, was never replicated. And, and you could see that some of those columns are still standing as you, as you go down to the Keys. Uh, our turrets. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right, right. but yeah. It's, it's
Well, thank you, Paul. I uh, do appreciate uh, all the great information about Henry Flagler. Hopefully the, the listeners have, have learned a little bit more about uh, the man that Flagler Street's named for. Uh, of course, Flagler is commemorated by Flagler Street, really the, the main corridor of downtown Miami for many, many years. Uh, but also by a statue at the uh, the Miami-Dade County Courthouse. So for those who are listening for the first time and are not familiar with that, uh, the go down to the Miami-Dade uh, County Courthouse and you'll see a, a nice statue of Henry Flagler with a little write-up about who he was. And uh, Paul, when was that dedicated? That it was, was dedicated on the city's birthday in 2005, a rainy day, July 28th, uh, 2005. And it's really an impressive uh, statue. Uh, on hand for that and responsible for it largely was a uh, great-grandson of Henry Flagler, a, uh, a Marine Corps officer, in fact. Oh, wonderful. So uh, we uh, both of us would like to thank all those who are listening and still listening. And uh, we do encourage you once again, we have to put a plug in for the Miami History Channel. Uh, go to MiamiHC.com. Uh, check out some of the free previews and, uh, you know, feel free to join. We'd love your support. We'd love you to to uh, learn about Miami history through uh, the set of documentaries that are out there and available. Uh, and uh, we'll be coming back. Our next podcast will actually be focusing on Julia Tuttle. So we're going to continue with the theme of uh, Miami pioneers, the mother of Miami, now that we've talked about the father of Miami. So thank you very much and look forward to and hope you'll tune in for the next uh, uh, podcast. Podcast.